a fire, but you kind of had to, or you couldn't be in the game. But what about the professional money managers on Wall Street? Didn't they realize that we were in the midst of a lunatic speculative bubble? Most people were thinking, okay, no, they're not all going to survive, but we don't know exactly who is and how long it's going to take. And in the meantime, the punishment we are taking for not owning the sector, for sitting here and saying, someday it's going to crash, is a lot of us are getting fired. Blodgett knew that a lot of e-commerce companies were fundamentally unsound. But his argument was that this wasn't necessarily a good reason not to buy their stocks. The trouble for him was that on occasion, he put his unvarnished views of these outfits into private emails. And that would later come back to haunt him when the bubble popped. You know, remember the Henry Blodgett email where he wrote this thing? He said, you know, this piece of company, but we have to recommend it. You know, he was, he was an analyst inside an investment bank. He knew the company was garbage, and yet he was recommending it because that was how they made their money. You know, he actually got in trouble, but in a way, in a sense, he was actually one of the few honest people in the whole process. The internet boom had now officially turned into a speculative bubble. But it wasn't the only financial mania happening at the time. A second one, closely related, was in telecommunications. Dozens of companies were racing to stick thousands of miles of fiber optic cable into the ground to accommodate the swelling demand for bandwidth that made the internet go. To understand why this is important, it's time again for a little bit of tech talk. Like most internet technology, fiber optics relies on the extraordinary properties of ordinary materials. The silicon chip ultimately starts as sand, and fiber optic cable is made from either glass or plastic. Fiber is essentially a strand of glass as thin as a human hair, which carries beams of light. Light travels in straight lines, but fiber bends and twists for thousands of miles, so you would expect the light to shoot out at first bend. Well, to stop this from happening, fiber is coated with a kind of mirrored surface, which keeps the light inside. But how exactly do rays of light enable the transmission of text and pictures and videos and emails and all the rest. It uses an idea of great simplicity that dates back to the days when ships at sea had to find a way to communicate. They would flash lights at one another using Morse code. A combination of long flashes and short flashes would then be decoded into letters of the alphabet. That's pretty much how fiber uses light to carry information. The light isn't a continuous stream, it's a stream of pulses representing the ones and zeros that comprise computer code. But while a Morse code operator might be at best able to send one or two flashes a second, fiber optic cables can carry some 10 billion pulses of digital information every second. Now, the question you might ask is, how did the internet cope with this massive explosion in users and data? Why didn't it just grind to a halt? The answer lies in an extremely clever, though simple idea that all of us are familiar with, but in a different context. It turns out that data is directed around the internet in much the same way that road signs direct car drivers around the road network. Here's how it works. Let's say that you start out in New York and you want to drive to Boston. So when you're far away from Boston, what you see on road signs is Boston, keep right. On the big roads, you just learn, know about big destinations. On the smaller roads, you learn about progressively smaller destinations. OK, so now how do we make all of this fit onto the internet? It turns out, if I'm in San Francisco or New York, and I want to get to Harvard on the internet, I don't need to know which computer at Harvard I want to go to, because when I'm that far away, the only thing I care about is that I'm making progress toward that one gateway that goes to all of Harvard. Useful? Totally. But the problem was the firms that were laying all this fiber got way ahead of themselves. There was too much building, too much spending, too many companies doing the same thing as each other, with no thought for costs or consequences. 1999 was a wild year, almost impossible to fathom now. From the start of the boom in 1995, there had never been more than 30 internet companies to go public in any given year. In 1999, the total number of internet IPOs was 250. But eBay and Amazon stood head and shoulders above the rest of the dot-com crowd. eBay's market value on the NASDAQ was now $21 billion, and it was even profitable. And while Bezos' company couldn't say the same, it was racking up sales of $1.6 billion a year, and its own market cap was a staggering $37 billion. 
And Jeff was always saying to us, actually, do not keep your eye on the stock price, which I think was very intelligent of him. You know, do your job here the best you can, do everything you can for the company. I never said to myself, gee, you know, I'm the $10 million book reviewer, because there was clearly such a disconnect between the job you were doing and the rewards you were getting. Now, as the turn of the millennium drew near, Jeff Bezos was given an accolade that in the past had been accorded to the likes of Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Adolf Hitler. He was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year as the embodiment of e-commerce. For Bezos, this was quite an honor, a sign that he'd been elevated into the pantheon of American business icons. But more cynical minds read it another way, as a sign that the end was nigh. The epicenters of the internet bubble may have been Silicon Valley and Wall Street, but there was one central player who resided in Washington, D.C., the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan. Though Greenspan famously said that irrational exuberance was fueling the bubble, he'd done precious little during the 1990s to try and prick it. Greenspan believed that technology was creating a new economy, one where the old rules no longer applied. But after witnessing the stock market's crazy run-up in 1999, and after glimpsing signs that the overall economy was dangerously close to overheating, Greenspan decided that the time had finally come to cool things down. In February of 2000, and then again in March, the Fed raised interest rates to their highest level since 1995, moves that signaled that Greenspan was now determined to put the bubble to an end. At the same time that Greenspan was making his moves, Wall Street began to train a more sober eye on its dot-com darlings. The holiday season that many had expected to bring a rush of revenues into the e-commerce companies had proved a major disappointment. Suddenly, Wall Street began to doubt the wisdom of Get Big Fast and to suspect that many of the web retailers were nothing but a house of cards, something that programmer and messed up company chronicler Philip Kaplan had known for some time. There would be e-commerce sites that we would build where I know that the, the client would have spent two, three, four million dollars on these websites. I'd log into the database every now and then and see they had like, you know, $20 worth of sales, $25 worth of sales, $100 worth of sales. On April 14th, 1912, the Titanic had its fateful collision with an iceberg and dropped to the bottom of the ocean. And exactly 88 years later, to the day, the internet economy met a similar fate. On what would forever after be known on Wall Street as Black Friday, the Nasdaq fell an astonishing 355 points, bringing to an awful end a week in which the index had fallen by more than 25%, the single greatest collapse in the history of the stock market. In the wake of Black Friday, it wasn't just the useless startups that found themselves in trouble. Even mighty Amazon was under siege in Wall Street's crosshairs, fighting for its very survival. For Amazon especially, it was not a foregone conclusion. They got very close to bankruptcy. As Amazon's shares plummeted, so did Amazon employee James Marcus's paper riches. He was no longer the planet's most wealthy book reviewer. I was very happy to have all that money. And if there was